When I was growing up as a fan of rock music, disco was a punchline. Just saying the name called to mind images of out-of-date fashion, lame dance moves, and overblown corporate pop. It was pitched to me as the antithesis of real music, played by the 70s rock gods, as represented by bands like Queen, The Rolling Stones, or Pink Floyd. Of course, all three of those bands would, in their own time, record disco songs because disco was an interesting and exciting musical movement. None of this mattered to disco's haters, who rallied around the simple and omnipresent slogan, Disco Sucks. But the Disco Sucks movement wasn't just a reflection of an aesthetic distaste. It was part of a broader social and political backlash. That backlash tanked the genre's chart viability and relegated it to obscurity for decades, denying it the credit that it was due. But in recent years, people are finally reviving disco and celebrating it for what it is, a truly brilliant movement that laid the groundwork for nearly the entirety of modern music. Today we're going to talk about disco, not just because it's a movement that deserves to be celebrated, but because the story of disco's birth and subsequent death is deeply relevant to some of the most important social and political battles being fought today. I feel music in One of the most infamous moments in disco history happened on July 12, 1979. Tens of thousands of people gathered in Comiskey Park to celebrate their hate of disco and destroy disco records at the Disco Demolition Night. That event escalated into a riot and is seen by many as the final nail in the coffin of the genre. But before we can get too deep into Disco Demolition Night, we need to rewind 10 years and start the story at a different sort of riot altogether. On June 28, 1969, the New York Police Department raided Greenwich Village's Stonewall Inn, a gay bar and cornerstone of the neighborhood's queer community. At the time, homosexuality was still considered a mental illness and illegal in 49 states in the U.S., in keeping with these laws, queer folk were subject to brutal, dehumanizing treatment. The FBI surveilled known homosexuals, the post office tracked mail containing gay material, university professors were fired if they were suspected of being gay, and gay bars were frequently raided by the police. In these raids, people who presented feminine would be stripped, frisked, and arrested if they were discovered to not be cisgender. Patrons would often also be extorted, harassed, and subject to all sorts of dehumanizing treatment. But this time, when the police showed up to the Stonewall in a surprise raid, the patrons refused to comply. The women in the pub wouldn't allow themselves to be searched, and the men refused to show the police their ID. As the police grew more aggressive, a crowd started to gather outside of the bar. And when the cops got violent, the patrons responded in kind. The growing crowds erupted into a riot that lasted for two days. These riots are a landmark moment in American history and are often seen as the birth of the gay rights movement. And while there's plenty to be said about the political movement that grew out of Stonewall, today we're here to talk about the cultural movement. Because the Stonewall Inn was predominantly a dance bar. It was a place where the LGBT community could escape the world and express love for each other in spite of legislation banning same-sex dancing. So it's fitting that one of the first laws knocked down after Stonewall was that very ban. But when same-sex dancing was made legal, most mainstream nightclubs instituted their own house policies banning it. So the gay community went underground and began to open up their own places to party at. Rather than having live bands, these places would play music off of records. Because of this, they were called discotheques. In the aftermath of Stonewall, New York saw an explosion of underground discotheques, but Stonewall wasn't the only influence on them. 
The emergence of these underground clubs was also tied to a related cultural movement, the hippies. The 60s had been a time of massive cultural upheaval. It was a moment of radicalism and hedonism, with new drugs bringing on a sexual revolution and a new generation of youth asserting their own place in the world. But as the decade turned, things shifted for much of the movement. The Manson murders and tragedy at the Altamont Free Festival seemed to ring the end of the hippie movement, and many people started to trade their tie-dyes in for neckties and return to participating in society. But some weren't ready to leave the hedonism behind, so they turned to the discotheques. These underground clubs became havens for drug users, oddballs, and anyone who didn't want to play along with society's straight-laced standards. The most famous of these clubs was probably The Loft, which was the home of a DJ and psychedelic enthusiast named David Mancuso. Mancuso's parties were meant to be non-commercial spaces, continuing the free love dream that the 60s had birthed. And they were the stuff of legend, all-night utopian bacchanals scored by only the finest dance grooves. His audiences were mostly black, Latino, and gay, but as the loft gained notoriety, it started to draw partygoers from all walks of life. Seeing the success of the loft, other underground discos opened up across New York. The church opened on West 43rd Street, decorated with lewd images of angels and demons. The gallery was famous for its DJ Nicky Ciano, who was an early pioneer in record mixing, using a three turntable setup that let him loop his dance breaks as long as he wanted. And the pavilion on Fire Island became known for sweaty, sexual parties that would rage all night long and keep going until 10 or 11 in the morning the next day. At first, these clubs played any and all sorts of music. Album cuts from obscure psychedelic rock records, jazz fusion, and classic soul singles. It was less about style and more about mood. DJs wanted songs that rode a groove so that their patrons could lose themselves in the rhythms and escape the harsh realities of being gay, trans, or otherwise marginalized in the world. But in the search for the best groove, underground DJs soon found themselves at the forefront of curating a new kind of sound that would change music forever. The emergence of disco sound is unique in music history. Typically, a genre will be codified by a group of musicians pulling off of each other's influence, often growing out of the same geographical scene. But the sound of disco was instead curated by DJs pulling music from all sorts of different scenes and picking the best, rarest pieces that fit into a particular emotional space. These DJs liked longer songs because they allowed for the mood to build on a dance floor. For this, they looked to the growing genre of progressive soul, where genius auteurs were riding grooves for upward of 10 minutes on songs like Move On Up or Walk On By. Isaac Hayes was especially influential on the emergence of disco. Just look at his landmark piece, Theme From Shaft. Who's the black pride of dick that's a sex machine to all the chicks? You're damn right. That song features sound palettes that would come to define disco, flutes, strings, and an undeniably funky wah-wah guitar. Can you dig it? Another big influence on the guitar of disco was the chicken scratch technique made famous by Jimmy Nolan, who was a key member in James Brown's band. Get up, get on up, get up, get on up, stay on the scene. Get on up. A lot of disco's roots come from soul, particularly the Philadelphia soul scene, where a new generation of musicians were putting their stamp on music history with lush string arrangements. One Philly soul hit in particular became incredibly influential, The Love I Lost by Harold Melvin. 
In that song, session drummer Earl Young laid down a rhythm that would become the foundational disco beat. That pattern was of course the four to the floor, where the kick drum hits right on every beat of a 4-4 four, four song. Young paired this kick drum with a sloshing open hi-hat and created a sound that's still imitated to this day. Influences came from further distances too. Disco pulled heavily on Latin American dance music and even drew from some of the pop music happening in Africa in the early 70s. One of the earliest hits that might be called disco was Manu de Bango's Soul Maku. <laughs> It was David Mancuso who introduced that song to the disco world. He got his hands on a copy and put it into regular rotation at the loft. From there, it found its way into the hands of Frankie Crocker, the program director at New York's WBLS, and before long, it had cracked the American Top 40. This might represent the first time that disco got mainstream attention, but record executives hadn't yet caught on. They thought Soul Makosa was a novelty international single, so they paid it no mind. In 1973, Barry White's orchestra released Love's Theme, a sweeping orchestral piece driven by a wah-wah guitar group. That song took off in the underground discotheques, becoming a club staple and then spilling over into the mainstream. Where Soul Makosa only reached number 35, Love's theme topped the American charts. There was a clear groundswell growing and music producers were starting to take note. They realized that if they created longer songs that dwelled more on grooves, they could find their way into club playlists. And a shift started to happen. For the first few years, discotheque music had been a one-way street, with DJs plundering crates for the rarest of grooves. But now it was becoming a conversation, with musicians and producers creating the sorts of songs they thought these DJs might want to spin. By 1973, it was clear that the pot was starting to bubble, but it was still contained within black and queer communities. Then, global economic forces pushed disco over the top. The organization of Arab petroleum exporting countries declared an oil embargo and Western economies tanked. A generation of lower middle class kids raised on hippie hedonism were suddenly unsure about their futures. Nixon was resigning in scandal and unemployment was on the rise. So people started to find escape in music. But rock shows were expensive and discos were cheap. New discos started to pop up everywhere, even in communities that were predominantly white. As this disco surge was happening, Hughes Corporation released a song called Rock the Boat. Despite getting no radio airplay in the beginning, Rock the Boat raced up the charts thanks to club play. And on July 4th, 1974, Rock the Boat topped the US charts. The very next week, Rock the Boat was knocked off by another disco song out of Miami, George McRae's Rock Your Baby. This time, the music industry caught on. And almost five years to the day after the Stonewall riots, disco had finally made it to the mainstream. 1975 and 76 saw a string of disco hits, including Donna Summer's magnificent Love to Love You Baby, written by the legendary Giorgio Moroder. <laughs> While disco auteurs were having their early hits, studios were also pumping out vacant disco song after vacant disco song. 
The original club DJs rejected these songs, refusing to play them. But the songs became the soundtracks of Holiday Inn dance floors and strip mall discos, which was enough to push them to the charts. Still, by 76, it was looking like disco might just be a passing fad. A string of indistinguishable studio hits had soured the public's taste on the genre. In September 1976, a Memphis disc jockey named Rick Dees released a parody song called Disco Duck, satirizing this oversaturated disco environment. Look at me, I'm the disco That song topped the U.S. charts, and it seemed to be a signal that the world was tiring of the disco fad. But then a building went up for sale right in the heart of New York. The building was at 254 West 54th Street. It was a former TV studio that had once belonged to CBS. Two entrepreneurs named Steve Rubell and Ian Schrager bought up the space and turned it into a discotheque the likes of which the world had never seen. On April 26th, 1977, the club opened under the name Studio 54, and that's when the pot boiled over. <laughs> If there's one word that can be used to describe Studio 54, it's opulent. The club space converted the existing TV studio infrastructure into a partygoer's paradise. They set up dynamic lights, movable theatrical sets, and even featured an automated bridge that moved over the massive dance floor. Studio 54 found success almost from the very beginning, thanks to the legendary club promoter Carmen D'Alessio. Within a week of Studio 54 opening, fashion designer Halston threw a party for Mick Jagger's wife, Bianca. That party featured dozens of A-list celebrities and culminated with the DJ spinning Sympathy for the Devil at midnight while a naked man covered in glitter rode a white horse into the club. Bianca Jagger climbed onto that horse and an image of her riding it on the dance floor was all over the press by the next morning. Suddenly, Disco was the epitome of cool. And Studio 54's parties only grew more lavish from there. They featured flamboyant drag queens, buff bartenders, and elaborate set pieces. And, of course, drugs. Like, a lot of drugs. Studio 54 employed someone named Lenny54, whose entire job was to hang out with celebrities and do drugs with them. At one Christmas party, they put together gift baggies of cocaine for some of their most famous attendees. And with the drugs came sex. The parties were so wild that they featured a balcony made entirely of rubber so that the staff could easily clean bodily fluids off of it. The guest list for these bacchanals featured everyone from Andy Warhol and Michael Jackson to Salvador Dali and Margaret Trudeau. But even as Studio 54 was bringing disco to the masses, it was trying to retain some of the ethos that had birthed disco. The club was determined to remain a bastion for the queer community. The security team was headed by a gay man named Mark Benecki, and he ran a tight ship. So much so that Andy Warhol once called the club's security a dictatorship. Under Benecki's reign, security would regularly turn away groups of straight white men, and even turned away celebrities and musicians. On New Year's Eve 1977, the band Chic were turned away by security. Rather than rage, they channeled their energy into writing a new song, Le Freak. Oh, Le Freak became one of the most lasting disco hits and was a staple on any disco dance floor. On the back of Studio 54, disco saw a meteoric rise through 1977. That same year, the film Saturday Night Fever dropped with a soundtrack full of disco hits. That was a cultural phenomenon, and it launched the Bee Gees to international success. The Bee Gees are a turning point, as they were one of the first white groups to latch on to disco. 
but the communities that originated disco were still present all over the charts. Sylvester was an openly gay, gender-bending musician who became known as the queen of disco thanks to hits like Dance, Disco Heat. The Disco Queen title was one that Sylvester shared with Donna Summer, who vaulted to new levels of success as disco continued its surge. In the summer of 77, she collaborated with Giorgio Moroder for one of the most important disco songs ever recorded, I Feel Love. Like Donna Summer, Gloria Gaynor was one of the early disco divas, but her success faltered in 1976. After breaking her back and needing to relearn how to walk, Gaynor wrote the anthemic I Will Survive. When that record failed to perform on the charts, she brought it to Richie Kazor, the DJ at Studio 54. Kazor's power was such that he almost single-handedly made it a hit. While Gaynor, like most of the disco divas, wasn't gay herself, the message of I Will Survive resonated with the struggles that a lot of gay people had been through. The same year that Gaynor released I Will Survive, the village people topped charts around the world with YMCA. Village People's aesthetic was born out of gay and kink communities, and YMCA is a song with a strong subtext of cruising and hookup culture. But in a lot of ways, I think that the success of YMCA also represents the beginning of the end for disco's first wave. Today, YMCA is still played at weddings and elementary school assemblies. It's thought of as a fun, sing-along, dance-along novelty song. And it is all of those things, but it's also a song that's an expression of an important part of gay culture. Nearly 50 years on, many of these aspects of disco have been forgotten or erased in the cultural narrative. And a lot of that has to do with what happened when disco reached its pinnacle. Didn't take long for the realization to set in that rock fans under the influence of beer and drugs and onto a disco record they had been invited to destroy don't mix with baseball. By the late 1970s, disco had gone international. ABBA fully embraced the genre on Voulez Vous and helped birth Euro disco in the process. Meanwhile, back in the States, bigger and bigger artists were jumping onto the disco bandwagon. The one-time child star Michael Jackson had resurfaced with full creative control and released one of the greatest disco records ever made. A number of rock acts were dabbling in disco and finding chart success for it too. In 1978, both Rod Stewart and the Rolling Stones tried out disco and were rewarded with massive success, reinvigorating both of their careers. I've been hanging out so long, I've been sleeping all alone, Lord, I miss you. In 79, Pink Floyd even took a crack at disco with Another Brick in the Wall Part 2. That same year, CBGB Darling's Blondie released the immortal Heart of Glass. Even Dolly Parton got in on the disco action. All of this resulted in a boom of disco radio. Rock stations turned into disco stations, and some producers stopped aiming for the dance floor altogether, finding it more profitable to build disco songs straight for the radio. But there's a problem inherent in this. 
at its core, disco music was meant to be played on a sweaty dance floor. This drive of commercialism had stripped it of its roots. Journalist Andrew Holleran described this disco as light years away from the old dark disco, which didn't know it was disco. And so, in the face of an oversaturated market, a new fad started to rise. The fad of hating disco. The Disco Suck slogan had originally spun off from Rick D's Disco Duck, and by 79, Disco Suck's t-shirts and bumper stickers were everywhere. A lot of people in the emergent punk community took issue with the corporatization of disco and its choice to go for hedonism rather than have an overt political message. Of course, in its conception, disco was fundamentally political. When you are discriminated against based upon who you have sex with, the act of having sex becomes political. Overt displays of hedonism become acts of protest. A lot of the disco backlash did have to do with the mainstreaming of the genre, but make no mistake, the fact that disco was born from gay communities was not lost on the disco haters. When we hear the term sucks today, it has a much more tame connotation. In the 70s, the use of sucks was very pointed due to its heavy homophobic undertones, and not all attacks were so subtle. In Detroit, an anti-disco group called themselves the Disco Ducks Clan. For a time, this group even had plans to protest disco records while wearing white sheets. While they scrapped that idea, the concept is nonetheless pointed for people protesting a musical movement pioneered by the black music community. Many movements in music history have had their backlash of haters, but few have been so overt and so violent. Destroying disco records became a trend throughout the late 70s. In Seattle, hundreds of rock fans attacked a mobile dance floor, while in Portland, a rock DJ destroyed disco records with a chainsaw. Niall Rogers said that this era of destroying disco records felt like Nazi book burning. Rock writer Dave Marsh described it succinctly. White males 18 to 34 are most likely to see disco as the product of homosexuals, blacks, and Latins, and therefore most likely to respond to appeals to wipe out such threats to their security. It almost goes without saying that such appeals are racist and sexist. The de facto leader of this anti-disco movement was Steve Dahl, a Chicago rock DJ. After being fired by a radio station that converted to disco, Dahl stirred his fans up into a fervor. He held anti-disco rallies, where he would tell homophobic jokes and rile up crowds of young white men. He called these followers the Insane Coho Lips, naming them after a fish introduced into Lake Michigan to eradicate parasitic eels. It was Steve Dahl's fervor that led to the riot that would ultimately end disco. On July 12, 1979, more than 50,000 people piled into Comiskey Park, shouting homophobic and racist slurs, throwing disco records around like frisbees, and piling them into a giant bin. Dahl led a chant of Disco Sucks before exploding the bin of records with firecrackers. Drunk and riled up, the Coho stormed the field, trashing the stadium and destroying any disco record they could find. It was a violent act of revenge against a music that had dared to challenge the sexual and racial norms of middle America. Almost overnight, the musical landscape had changed. Disco labels went from selling out across the country to having trouble getting people to even pick up the phone. In the two years leading up to Disco Demolition Night, Chic had released four singles that cracked the Billboard Top 10, including two number one hits. After that night, they never hit the Top 40 again. From 1975 to 79, Earth, Wind & Fire had a run of four consecutive multi-platinum albums. That streak ended with their first record released post-Disco Demolition. And the backlash might be most stark when you look at the Bee Gees discography. In a two-year period between 77 and 79, the Bee Gees had six different songs top the US charts. After Demolition Night, they'd need to wait a decade to have another song crack the top 10. Some of the remnants of disco continued into the 80s on the backs of Donna Summer and Michael Jackson, but it was clear that things had changed. And if Disco Demolition Night wasn't enough, AIDS hit the United States in 1981. Left deliberately unchecked by a socially conservative Reagan government, AIDS ran rampant through gay communities, 
demolishing culture and leaving hundreds of thousands of dead in its wake. After two decades of progress for sexual and racial minorities, America backslid into the conservative 80s. But not all was lost, because out of the ashes of the first wave of disco, new movements started to rise. Movements that would come to reshape the musical landscape and create the world that we live in today. I said a hip hop, a hip it, a hip it, a hip hip hop, you don't stop the rocket to the bang bang boogie, say up jump the boogie to the rhythm of the boogie to beat. Now what you hear is not a test, I'm rapping to the beat. By October 1979, the ashes of the disco backlash were starting to settle. Sheik's mega hit Good Times had plummeted from the charts, and the mainstream seemed ready to move on from disco. But in the underground, there was something else happening. Young black men in the Bronx were taking the role of the disco DJ and evolving it. Inspired by the likes of Nicky Ciano, they'd started using the turntable itself as an instrument, finding the best drum breakdowns and looping them over and over again so people could dance as long as they wanted. They continued the disco trend of crate digging, looking for obscure records with strange sounds that they could bring to light. These DJs started to add their own personalities on top of these drum loops, putting together braggadocious boasts and rhymes. And they called this new style, hip hop. An entrepreneurial young executive named Sylvia Robinson saw the potential in this new musical movement, so she put together a group and had them record a song called Rapper's Delight. You see, I am Wonder Mike and I like to say hello. Up to the black, to the white, the red and the brown, the purple and yellow. But first, I gotta... That song was built around a sample of Good Times by Sheep. Good Times! And just as disco was falling off the charts, the first recorded rap song was finding modest success in the top 40. And hip-hop wouldn't be the only genre to rise out of the ashes of disco. Georgia Moritor's synthesizer work on Donna Summer's I Feel Love was essential to the birth of a movement that would come to be called electronic dance music, or EDM. By the time the 90s rolled round, a new wave of disco was taking over in underground scenes. And even a lot of Top 40 pop through the 90s and 2000s was a sort of dance funk heavily influenced by Michael Jackson and the Euro disco of ABBA. And today, we're in the middle of a true disco resurgence. In the last few years, the likes of Doja Cat, Dua Lipa, and Lizzo have released songs that are full-on disco, hearkening back to the golden age of 1977. And finally, disco is starting to shake some of the reputation that it got thanks to its backlash. We don't talk enough about just how disco shaped the world that we live in today. And now, more than ever, it's important to change that. Much like the 1970s, the 2010s were an era of progress for the LGBT community. But after a decade of victories, after having queer artists top charts, and queer art forms become mainstream, the backlash is coming once more. Only this time, it's not just records being destroyed. The last few years have seen a rise in attacks against trans people, especially black trans people. In the United States, Republican legislators are passing overtly homophobic and transphobic laws, banning books and denying medical care to trans people. Like disco before it, pride culture has become commercialized and mainstream. And like disco before it, people are rallying against that fact. Only now it's not just salty radio DJs. It's TV anchors and legislators. It's online influencers with millions of followers. The story of disco is important because it's a reminder that marginalized communities have power. Power to create art that will give people meaning, that will help people persevere. Power to create art that will shift culture, and power to create art that will change history. And it's a reminder that as long as we have that power, someone will be trying to co-opt it, to corporatize it and monetize it, to erase it from history, or to take it away with violence.